in this video I'll be introducing some properties of arrows which are going to be very important in the future. So the first thing I'm going to introduce is some new notation for HOM sets. So before I just wrote HOM of a B, which is sort of a bad notation because we have no clue what category we're talking about for these objects. And so a standard notation is to write the category as a little subscript on the HOM. However, just to avoid the hassle of having to write HOM sub C of AB, I'm instead just going to write C of AB. So, for example, I would write that the composition of arrows is a function and it takes in some arrow, which is from B to C, and some arrow, which is from A to B, and it'll output an arrow from A to C. So this function would input G and F, and it would output G composed F. And this is of course assuming that the category is locally small so that this will in fact be a function. So on locally small categories, you can just view composition as a function which takes in two arrows. All right, so the first construction I'm gonna do on arrows is called the opposite category. So given a category C, we can construct what is known as the opposite category, C op. And what it does is it preserves the object. So the objects of the opposite category are the objects of the normal category. However, the arrows, if I have an arrow from A to B, and this is some arrow of C, then I will construct a new arrow, which will be a, an arrow of C op called F op, and it will just be from B to A. So the arrows of an opposite category are just the arrows of C, but you flip the order of the domain and codomain. Now this category will be important when we talk about contravariant functors and sheaves, which uh, I card. So the way we define composition is that if I have F op, and this is from C to B, and I have G op from B to A, I define G op composed F op to be equal to, well let's go ahead and write out the diagram in the normal category, so this is G from A to B and F from B to C. So it flips the order of this diagram. And what I can do is I can do F composed G within this category and then I will have to do the opposite of that to move it back into the opposite category. And so that's how you define composition on opposite arrows. Now let me go ahead and introduce inverses. Obviously, if I have an arrow F from A to B, a right inverse is an arrow from B to A such that F composed R, so that it's on the right hand side, is going to be equal to the identity on B. And a left inverse would be one where it's the opposite. It's a morphism L from B to A such that L composed F is the identity on A. So right inverses, you compose it on the right. Left inverses, you compose it on the left. Now these are going to be important properties when dealing with arrows, whether they have a left inverse, whether they have a right inverse. And we can easily define what is known as an invertible arrow. So if I have F from A to B, we call it invertible if there exists a unique arrow, F inverse, from B to A, such that it is both a left and a right inverse. So this is called an invertible arrow and or an isomorphism. And if I have two objects, A and B, such that there exists an isomorphism F between them, and this is an isomorphism, so I'll write a little tilde over the arrow. So that's how you identify uh, invertible arrows. So if we have an isomorphism between two objects, we call the two objects isomorphic and we write a congruence between them. And then this equivalence via isomorphisms is going to create an equivalence relation on the objects of that category. Now, a very closely related idea to inverses are monics and epics. Now, what a monic is, is it's, it's sort of like having a left inverse, but it's not necessarily required. 
Really what it is, is it's the equivalent of an injective map just for arrows in general. So if I have an arrow from A to B, so I have A, B, and I have F and arrow between them, then if I have any other arrows going from some other object C into A, so let's say G1 and G2, and we have it that F composed G1 is equal to F composed G2, then we have it that G1 is equal to G2. So you can clearly see how this is the equivalent of an injective map just for general arrows. And then an epic is like this thing, but in reverse. So if we have an arrow from A to B, then if we have any arrows going from B into some other object C, let's call them G1 and G2, you can probably guess where this is going. And we have it that their composition with F is equal to each other then that means that they are in fact equal to each other. Now if we have an arrow f from a to b and it has a left inverse, let's call it l, l composed f is equal to the identity on a, we can tell that it is in fact going to be monic. The reason why is because if f composed g1 is equal to f composed g2, I'll just do l composed on both sides. Uh, by equivalence properties, we know that this has they have to remain equal to each other. By associativity, I can just get the identity arrows, and then by the identity arrows, these are just equal to each other. And then same thing with right inverses. If I have f from a to b and I have a right inverse, so f composed r is equal to the identity on b, then we can tell that it's epic but it doesn't necessarily go the other way around. And so this is the connection between invertible arrows and monics and epics. So sort of contrary to what we want for these definitions are item potent arrows. So if I have an arrow F from A to A, such that F composed F is equal to F. So these are item potent arrows where F squared is itself and a specific type are where if I have an arrow G and I have an arrow H, which are the identity on some arrow A, then I can define an arrow F as H composed G. And then F composed F is then going to be equal to H composed G composed H composed G. Right here is G composed H. Then from the definition, that's an identity. So we just get H composed G, which is F out the other side. So these examples where you flip the order of composing of uh, two inverses of each other, you get an item potent element. And we call these specific types split item potent. The last definitions I'm going to introduce are of terminal and initial objects. Now what a terminal object is, is it's like the ending of a category via the arrows. So let me go ahead and draw out what I mean. Now let's write this out formally. So we say A is terminal if for every single object C of the category, we have, there is a unique arrow which takes you from C to A. And so it's terminal if every single object has a unique arrow which funnels it down to A. And then an initial object is the same way, but in reverse. So we have our object, it goes out to every single element of the category. So it's basically the reverse of an, a terminal object, which makes sense. So an object A is uh, initial if every single object of the category has a unique arrow from that initial object to that object of the category. So for example, on both the terminal and initial examples, the unique arrow from the object to itself is just the identity arrow because that's necessary. All right, let's do an example. An example of a terminal object is a one point set in the category of sets. So let's say we have some set X and we can direct it to the one point set. There is only one function from x to the one point set. 
it's sending every element of x to that single point. So every single object of the category has a unique arrow funneling into it, which is exactly what this is. Now what a null element is, a null object is going to be one which is initial and terminal. So let's say we have a null element, and I'll call it zero. Then if I have any two objects, A and B, then we have a unique arrow from A to O by the fact that it is terminal, and we have a unique arrow from O to B by the fact that it is initial. What I can do is I can compose those two arrows and get a unique arrow from A to B. And so for any two objects, a and B of the category, I have a morphism between them that just skips over the null object. And so that's why it's called null, because you can really just ignore it and have the same structure. Now we call this morphism going through the null element, we call this morphism a zero morphism. Now let's go ahead and think about the arrows between the null element and some other object. Well, we have an arrow going that way, and we have an arrow going that way. Now, due to the fact that this must be unique, these must be inverses of each other, because composition would have allowed different morphisms between them. And so, by the fact that this morphism right here has an inverse, every single object of the category is isomorphic to the null element. So the null object by this diagram is isomorphic to every other object of that category. And then by this morphism, by the fact that I can invert both of those, any objects of the category must be isomorphic to each other. And so a category with a null object, all of the objects of a category with a null object are isomorphic. So I'll go ahead and give you a problem for today, which is to prove that the composition of invertible arrows and or isomorphisms are invertible arrows and isomorphisms, and that the composition of monics or epics are monics or epics. And that's it.